the founding of the New Age movement can be traced back to the 19th century in Theosophy. This is the group that largely popularized this belief that we are heading out of the age of Pisces and into the astrological age of Aquarius, which to them will be an age of unity of humanity, an age of enlightenment, a spiritual age of consciousness, so to speak. very clear, yes, there's going to be a one world political, economic, religion, and this is what all the globalists, the, the elite, the high level occultists, the high level new world order people, this is what they're wanting, this is what the Bible pretty much clearly predicts as well, and this is obviously what we're moving to. The Freemason and one world government advocate Zbigniew Brzezinski said the following in his work Between Two Ages, quote, the technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite, unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. This admitted New World Order agenda to create a one-world government that rules over humanity is not only political, it is also spiritual and based on what is known as the New Age. This can be verified with irrefutable documentation. Most of the Christians doing this kind of work have been silenced, so I set out across the border to speak to the few researchers that are still left. There are not many researchers left who have not been deceived by the New Age. Speaking with these people helped confirm my position even more. The New World Order exists the elite are occultists who adhere to New Age doctrines and they are responsible for this new trend of discrediting Christianity, Jesus Christ, and the Christian New World Order researchers. There is a voluminous amount of data that I have obtained in my research on this subject, but after watching this production, do not believe me. Don't believe a word of what I'm saying. Do your own independent research and verify this for yourself. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. Here's the way they look at it. Here's their metaphor. Adam and Eve were held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, cruel, and vindictive God. Until Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free from this garden by giving him the gift of intellect. Through the use of intellect, man will conquer the earth, will conquer nature, and will himself become God. It's taught in every Masonic temple in this land, every secret brotherhood, every secret society, every mystical temple, every occult organization teaches the Luciferian philosophy. To understand the New World Order and the New Age worldview, we must go back into history and examine its origins. But first we must define our terms. By New Age, I am speaking about a worldview that has many facets and components, such as astrological and zodiacal beliefs in the New Age concept, channeling higher powers to achieve knowledge, meditation, the belief that all is one or forms of monism, the belief that we can attain godhood esotericism, or in other words, reinterpreting ancient texts to find hidden meanings and unify all religious belief in the one. The belief that we need a one world system for the coming age of Aquarius. By new world order, I am talking about a political agenda to create a one world system, one world government, one world economy, unity of humanity into one organism, control over humanity and submission of the masses. 
but today the largest countries of the world have agreed a global plan for recovery and reform. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. To understand what is going on today with respect to the new world order and the new age movement, we must have recourse to the 19th century organization called the Theosophical Society. This organization in particular, among others, is largely responsible for the modern New Age movement and the political doctrine known as the New World Order. The founder of this organization was a woman named Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Born August 12, 1831, Helena Blavatsky was very interested early in her life in the supernatural and the mythological. From 1848 to 1858, Blavatsky would travel the world to ascertain an understanding of the religious traditions of the world. She claimed to have traveled to South America, Egypt, Canada, France, Greece, Mexico, Tibet, India, Germany, and England during this time. It is said that during this travel she learned many mysteries, secrets, and occult knowledge from every walk of life. With all of this new esoteric information in her mind, she moved to New York in 1873. Then in 1875, she formed an occult organization called the Theosophical Society. She founded this society with two men, Colonel Henry Steele Alcott and William Quan Judge. According to Alcott, Theosophy already had thousands of members and branches all over the world by 1885. After New York, Blavatsky and Alcott established the Theosophical Headquarters in India and the membership roster grew increasingly as time went on. Blavatsky's influence came from her writings. Her first book was entitled Isis Unveiled, published in 1877. She started a magazine in 1887 called Lucifer Magazine. Her principal work, The Secret Doctrine, was then published in 1888. She then wrote The Key to Theosophy and The Voice of Silence. These works are now famous and contained in these writings are the doctrines that helped mold the New Age movement to what it is today. It is said that part of Blavatsky's book, The Secret Doctrine, was channeled to her through an ascended master or highly evolved being called Kuthumi who spoke to her. Belief in these ascended masters who communicate to humanity is very crucial when studying the New Age. We will look at that doctrine later. The age concept that says humanity is leaving the age of Pisces and entering the golden era or age of Aquarius was popularized by Blavatsky. She taught, Theosophists at any rate, some of them who understand the hidden meaning of the universally expected avatars, messiahs, socioshis and Christs, know that it is no end of the world but the consummation of the age, i.e. the close of a cycle which is now fast approaching. Again, the messianic cycle of the man connected with Pisces. It is a cycle, historical and not very long, but very occult, lasting about 2,155 solar years. It occurred 2,410 and 255 BC, or when the equinox entered into the sign of Ram, and again into that of Pisces. When it enters in a few years the sign of Aquarius, psychologists will have some extra work to do and the psychic idiosyncrasies of humanity will enter on a great change. These theosophists teach that Jesus was simply a representation of the age of Pisces and that he was an initiate into the mystery schools or cults of spiritual teachers and masters. They teach people that the new age of Aquarius is going to be that of a utopia where the world unites into a one world system the exiting out of Jesus' age and the entering into a new world teacher's age. They say each age is accompanied by a great world teacher, be it Buddha, Jesus, etc. So for the advent of the age of Aquarius, they claim a new world teacher will guide humanity into it. Blavatsky was reluctant to fuse these theosophic beliefs with politics, however. Nonetheless, she still advocated monism and a one world brotherhood or uniting of mankind. In Blavatsky's book, The Key to Theosophy, she lists three main goals of theosophy. Universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, color, or creed. 
to promote the study of the world's religions and to investigate the hidden mysteries of nature. As time went on, Theosophy got very popular. Many prominent figures would join the Theosophical Society from all over the world, and many popular doctrines of today's New Age movement would be molded and shaped by them. Theosophy is the first major New Age group, and they are largely responsible for many of the modern New Age beliefs, including the belief that Jesus represented the Sun God. After studying the occult and the esoteric in depth, I have come to the conclusion that the Zeitgeist movement and the Zeitgeist films are based on Theosophy, Freemasonry, and the New Age. For those who are unfamiliar, in 2007, a man named Peter Joseph released a film called Zeitgeist. This film received millions of views on the internet and became very popular. Then in 2008, Zeitgeist Addendum, the sequel, came out. From there, Peter Joseph established the Zeitgeist movement. Whether Zeitgeist was a film that was intended by Peter Joseph or whoever was behind it to be what it ended up being, I don't know. But I can, I can say that the message that's being uh, expressed by Zeitgeist is without a doubt the most clear depiction of the mystery school ideology. Um, and it's done in such a way to be, it's kind of what I've described as a sort of mystery schools for dummies. Um, it's, it's a way to get people that normally wouldn't be setting foot to any, uh, any various secret societies, it's a way to indoctrinate them and get them to believe in the same sort of elitist mindset uh, without having to go through any particular initiation. It's also uh, usually a company with an idea of pride, that is that, that is that, um, the people believe that what they believe uh, is uh, only for a select few and that sort of has this way of sticking with them and that um, that nobody believes what I believe and, and so it's sort of this elitist mindset that comes with that as well. The first Zeitgeist film was divided into three sections. The second section was about 9-11 being an inside job. The third section was about the corruption of the Federal Reserve. I have no real issue with the last two sections, but since the release of the first Zeitgeist film, Peter Joseph, the creator, has distanced himself from the 9-11 issue altogether. This makes me wonder if the only reason he spoke about 9-11 in the first film was to get the 9-11 truth movement on board with his agenda. The first section of the film is what I have an issue with. Contained in this section is the modern belief system of the New Age movement, the Theosophical Society, and Freemasonry. With the zeitgeist, it's, you know, Satan's good at what he does, bottom line. And the first one, what they do is they, they come right out and uh, in the first segment, I think the, the first 38 minutes, they just go after Jesus Christ his deity, basically what they try to do is convince everyone that Jesus Christ is just a knockoff of Horus and a lot of the other pagan deities and they try to draw all these parallels and similarities. These parallels and similarities have all been debunked by, by Bible scholars and things. In fact, I think there's even a couple challenges up on the internet, the Zeitgeist Challenge, where they offer money if they can actually. So they've been debunked. I've done, oh my word, I don't know how many teachings debunking both, both movies. But if somebody were to see that for the first time and not know any different, oh, hey, it sounds convincing, it sounds, you know, this or that. And so what they've got to do is discredit the Word of God, the deity of Jesus Christ. As theosophy grew, it produced influential figures such as Annie Wood Besant, born October 1st, 1847. She was a Marxist and a socialist. Besant was so inclined towards socialism that she defended it in public debates. One such debate was conducted between her and a man by the name of G. W. Foote, a secularist who supported republicanism. The debate was held at the Hall of Science on February 2nd, 9th, 16th, and 23rd, 1887, a four-night debate series. The title of the debate was, Is Socialism Sound? Angelique Richardson and Chris Willis from the University of London 
Institute for English Studies, when commenting on Besant's worldview, note, quote, The socialist feminist Annie Besant joined the Marxist-based Social Democrat Federation, SDF, in the 1880s. Annie Besant met the founder of Theosophy, Helena Blavatsky, in 1890, and she quickly read Blavatsky's material. Besant recorded her first acquaintance with Blavatsky. She wrote, quote, I was standing with my hand in her firm grip and looking for the first time in this life straight into the eyes of HPB. We rose to go, and for a moment veil lifted, and two brilliant piercing eyes met mine, and with a yearning throb in the voice, Oh my dear Mrs. Besant, if you would only come with us, I said a commonplace polite goodbye and turned away with some inanely courteous and evasive remark. Child, she said to me long afterwards, your pride is terrible. You are as proud as Lucifer himself. Besant would get involved with the secret society known as Freemasonry. In 1902, she established the International Order of Co-Freemasonry and then set up lodges all over the world with theosophic underpinnings. Theosophy, Freemasonry, and Marxism are all connected with the New Age movement. Besant would become president of the Theosophical Society in 1908. As I give you the history and lay the framework for the origins of the modern New World Order ideology and the New Age movement, it is important to note the role of Freemasonry. As previously noted, Theosophy and Freemasonry were somewhat affiliated in the late 19th century. In fact, Helena Blavatsky received an honorary degree of apprentice companion, perfect mistress, sublime elect Scotch lady, from the right of adoption. She was awarded with these titles by the 33rd degree Freemasons John Yarker, M. Kaspari, and A. D. Lowenstark. Here is a reprint of the Masonic certificate that Blavatsky received. There are many different views on the origins of Freemasonry. I will present the one which I feel is the most evidenced and well documented. Modern speculative Freemasonry wasn't officially established until 1717 in London with the founding of the first Grand Lodge. Prior to that there were Masonic Lodges in the late 16th century. You first have operative Masonry involving those who would work with stone and who were part of a stone guild that built cathedrals and buildings in the Middle Ages. Around the 17th century, these operative masons started accepting people into their craft who were not simply stone workers. Soon masonry was not simply limited to stone workers. They then later developed into modern speculative Freemasonry of today, which involves secret handshakes, codes, symbolism, mythology, and legendary. The earliest documentation of the word Freemason is in the calendar of the coroner's rolls of the City of London. This is dated 1300. 1378 AD, edited by Reginald Sharp and published in 1913. Commenting on the origins of Freemasonry, Harry Carr remarks, quote, It developed in Britain out of the building trades and fraternities, whose history goes back some 600 years in England. I do insist, however, that our present-day speculative Freemasonry is directly descended from the operative Masonry, whose beginnings we can trace back to the earliest record of organization among Masons in 1356. As far back as 1917, as modern Masonry was already 200 years old, people were recognizing the connection Freemasonry and Theosophy had. In the 1917 work, Heresies Exposed, W. Host remarks, quote, Freemasonry viewed doctrinally is Theosophy. With respect to the previously mentioned Zeitgeist films and the Zeitgeist movement, I will demonstrate that after a thorough study into these teachings of Theosophy and Freemasonry, it becomes quite clear that this film and movement, which has captivated so many truth seekers, is nothing more than the externalization of Theosophy, Freemasonry, and the New Age to the public. This is important because if it turns out that Zeitgeist is leading people into Theosophical and Freemasonic ideologies, it means that rather than standing against the New World Order, One World Government agenda like the anti-New World Order movement is supposed to be doing, truth seekers are actually associating themselves with ideologies and organizations that are connected to the New World Order, which I will also demonstrate. 
I will now qualify this hypothesis since I have laid the foundation for Theosophy and Freemasonry. Theosophy and Freemasonry. Theosophists and Freemasons, as part of their esoteric doctrine, taught that Jesus was the Sun God, the S-U-N in the sky, and that he was based on the age of Pisces within the Zodiac. The Marxist Theosophist Annie Besant taught her students, quote, then the sun retrograded in the Pisces at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Pisces influence being shown by cures performed by stepping into pools of water, Christ choosing his first apostles from fishermen." Unquote. Similarly, the founder of Theosophy, Helena Blavatsky, taught, quote, Ichthus, a fish, some of his early disciples were fishermen, Pisces, a conventional shape for the fish. Unquote. The notorious Freemason Manly Palmer Hall taught, quote, During the age of Pisces, the fish was the symbol of divinity, and the sun god fed the multitude with two small fishes. In another context, Blavatsky reinforces Theosophy's belief about Jesus, quote, For the salvation of the world, this was the sun, shorn of his golden rays, and crowned with blackened ones, symbolizing this loss as the thorns. Jesus and even Apollonius of Tyana were but epitomizers of the history of the sun. These doctrines are very sacred to Theosophists and Freemasons. The first section of the first film Zeitgeist externalizes these same Theosophic and Freemasonic beliefs, fringe views that historians and scholars dismiss. Zeitgeist repeats, quote, Jesus is the Son, the Son of God. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Aries, the age of Pisces." Unquote. Now, noticing these parallels, one might think that Peter Joseph, the creator of Zeitgeist, was ignorant of the fact that he was indoctrinating people into Theosophic and Freemasonic ideologies. However, Zeitgeist is not only spreading these doctrines of Theosophy and Freemasonry, but Zeitgeist also associates itself with prominent Theosophists, Freemasons, New Agers and Occultists in their own transcript for the film, leaving little debate as to the connection it has to these groups. Zeitgeist listed all of its sources for the film in its online transcript, and among the names of people appealed to are Helena Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy, the Freemason Albert Churchward, New Ager Acharya S., New Ager Occultist and Theosophical Apologist Jordan Maxwell, the Druid Gerald Massey, Edward Carpenter, the socialist and acquaintance of Theosophist, Freemason and Marxist Annie Besant, the Freemason Manly P. Hall, and the Druid Godfrey Higgins who is associated with Helena Blavatsky. The fact that Zeitgeist chooses to associate itself with these prominent Freemasons, Theosophists, New Agers and Occultists shows us why the Truth Movement should avoid them. It is a well-known fact that these same esoteric organizations have openly stated that they wish to indoctrinate the public with their esoteric religious ideas and externalize their views to humanity, eventually resulting in a new world order for the age of Aquarius, which they all await with anticipation. Let me qualify this. As Theosophy grew, it produced another prominent woman named Alice Bailey, born June 6, 1880. She is one of the most influential Theosophists, and it was her who was responsible for convincing New Agers that humanity needs to make a one-world government and one-world religion for the age of Aquarius. In order to achieve this system, she deemed it necessary to teach humanity the religion of Theosophy and Freemasonry, the same doctrines that Zeitgeist is now spreading. Speaking on the spiritual war between esotericists and people who refuse to accept the New Age, she says, quote, It will be fought largely with mental weapons and in the world of thought. It will involve also the emotional realm from the standpoint of idealistic fanaticism, this inherent fanaticism will fight against the appearance of the coming world religion and the spread of esotericism. It must not be forgotten that only those souls who are on the probationary path or the path of discipleship will form the nucleus of the coming world religion. There is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. When the Great One comes with his disciples and initiates, we shall have the restoration of the mysteries and their exoteric presentation as a consequence of the first initiation. Alice Bailey also reveals that Freemasonry is meant to produce advanced occultists and is in accord with the theosophical goals. Quote, the Masonic movement, when it can be, divorced from politics and social end, 
from its present paralyzing condition of inertia, will meet the need of those who can and should wield power. It is the custodian of the law, it is the home of the mysteries, and the seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity, and the way of salvation is pictorially preserved in its work. The methods of deity are demonstrated in its temples, and under the all-seeing eye, the work can go forward. It is a far more occult organization than can be realized, and it's intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultists." Unquote. The, the main source of Zeitgeist is Acharya S. She advocates one world system under the age of Aquarius. This is very interesting as the main source that this traces back to is Alice Bailey. Uh, you can trace this to one book in particular called The Externalization of the Hierarchy which advocates this extensively and even openly admits this in the first few pages of that volume. In his book The Arcana of Freemasonry, the Freemason Albert Churchward that Zeitgeist appealed to gave the following admission, quote, Can the unity of the world be accomplished by Freemasons? Yes, and by Freemasons only. There is a common misconception about Freemasonry, and that is that many people believe it is merely a friendly fraternity where men meet up to network and socialize. This is partially true, but there are elements of Freemasonry that are not so innocent. The Freemasonic Society was infiltrated in the late 18th century by an organization called the Order of the Illuminati. There is a lot of fictional, embellished information about the Illuminati, but if you sift through all of the data, there are some very important key facts. All historians will grant that the Illuminati certainly existed in Bavaria, Germany, and that it was founded in 1776 by a man named Adam Weisabt. This organization was a type of revolutionary organization that sought political and societal reform. The order grew and became very popular. It was then outlawed by the patriotic ruler of Bavaria, Duke Karl Theodore, he issued three edicts against the Illuminati, the third being in 1787. Illuminati writings were discovered after raids of castles and arrests of members. These writings were then translated from Old High German by two men contemporary with the Illuminati, Abe Beryl and John Robison. The writings were published in their works, Proofs of a Conspiracy, and Memoirs Illustrating the History of Jacobinism. The writings revealed that the Illuminati wanted a one-world system ruled by them. The overthrow of religion and the infiltration of Freemasonry to achieve this so that they could operate under another name and occupation. The founder of this order, Adam Weissab, stated, quote, Do you realize sufficiently what it means to rule, to rule in a secret society, not only over lesser or more important of the populace, but over the best of men? over men of all ranks, nations, and religions, to rule without external force, to unite them indissolubly, to breathe one spirit and soul into them, men distributed over all parts of the world. The prolific Freemasonic author and historian Albert Mackey reports, quote, To give the order a higher influence, Vicep connected it with the Masonic institution, after whose system of degrees in esoteric instruction and of secret modes of recognition it was organized. The order at first was very popular and enrolled no less than 2,000 names upon its registers, among whom were some of the most distinguished men of Germany. It extended rapidly into other countries and its lodges were to be found in France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Poland, Hungary, and Italy. The original design of Illuminism was undoubtedly the elevation of the human race, but it cannot be denied that in the process of time, abuses had crept into the institution, and that by the influence of unworthy men, the system became corrupted. So fused with Freemasonry in the 18th century was the doctrine of elitism and globalization, the overthrow of religion, namely Christianity. The question is, did the Illuminati cease to exist after it was outlawed in Bavaria, or did it live on? According to historians like Mackey and others, the Illuminati infiltrated Masonic lodges all over Europe before it was persecuted by the Bavarian government. So with that in mind, 
How could the Bavarian government stop this order if it was already all over Europe? The answer is they couldn't have. The Illuminati was too big, and thus it continued under Freemasonry. Continued under Freemasonry. The French historian Henry Martin reports, quote, Bicept, proposed as the end of Illuminism, the abolition of property, social authority, nationality, and the return of the human race to the happy state in which it formed only a single family without artificial needs, without useless sciences, every father being priest and magistrate. President George Washington himself was convinced that the Illuminati existed after 1785, when it was outlawed in Bavaria. He corresponded with the Reverend named G.W. Snyder, voicing his concerns about the Illuminati. This was written 13 years after the Illuminati was outlawed in Bavaria. George Washington states, quote, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plans and doctrines of the Illuminati. It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. The idea that I meant to convey was that I did not believe that the lodges of Freemasons in this country had, as societies, endeavored to propagate the diabolical tenets of the first or the pernicious principles of the latter, if they are susceptible of separation, that individuals of them may have done it, or that the founder or instrument employed to found the democratic societies in the United States may have had these objects and actually had the separation of people from their government in view is too evident to be questioned. From President Washington, we learned that he believed the Illuminati was nefarious and dangerous. He had little doubt about the Illuminati spreading to America by 1798. He was truly satisfied, or in other words, convinced of this fact. He thought it was too early for whole Masonic lodges to be striving for Illuminati objectives, but he did believe individuals within American lodges were certainly doing so. He believed the founder or instrument used to found the democratic societies in the USA may have had Illuminati objectives in mind and that they had the separation of the people from their government in view. According to Washington, these things are too evident to be questioned. That same year, the president of Yale University, Timothy Dwight IV, spoke out against the Illuminati. Quote, The great and good ends proposed by the Illuminati as the ultimate objects of their union are the overthrow of religion, government, and human society, civil and domestic. Joseph Willard, the president of Harvard University, said in a speech in New Hampshire, quote, There is sufficient evidence that a number of societies of the Illuminati have been established in this land of gospel light and civil liberty, which were first organized from the Grand Society in France. They are doubtless secretly striving to undermine all our ancient institutions, civil and sacred. These societies are closely leagued with those of the same order in Europe. They have all the same objects in view. The enemies of all order are seeking our ruin. Should infidelity generally prevail, our independence would fall of course. Our republican government would be annihilated. Speaking on this new Freemasonry that was infiltrated by Illuminati elitist doctrines, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, remarked, quote, I do conscientiously and sincerely believe that the order of Freemasonry, if not the greatest, is one of the greatest moral and political evils because this Illuminati doctrine of globalization and societal reform was fused into Freemasonry, later prominent Masons started voicing their anticipation of a new world order, one world system. Freemasonry is just one of many uh, ways to get people into the occult. It's, it's, but, but even more than that, it's um, able to get them into a really sort of packaged way to produce people that can be used in a more mechanical way in the system. That is, that they can be uh, put into places of power to turn a lot of the gears and things like that. Let me demonstrate that the high levels of Freemasonry and Theosophy are now simultaneously striving for a new world order, one world religion. Their dogma is that for the upcoming age of Aquarius, humanity needs to unite into a one world government or new world order.
the former Supreme Grand Master of the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross, or FRC, Reuben Swineborn Clymer, wrote in his work, Ancient Mystic Oriental Freemasonry, quote, Mystic Masonry is not only the key to the religion taught to all men in all ages from the very beginning of conscious life up to the present, but it holds the keys to these religious and is, in fact, the very repository of religion itself. It has for its object the uniting of mankind into a universal brotherhood. The 19th and 20th century Freemason and Rosicrucian Arthur Edward Waite admitted that secret societies he was involved with control political, scientific, and religious affairs. Waite believed that these societies always existed in every nation and are connected to modern societies, which I believe can be disputed. But nonetheless, he stated the following in his work, The Real History of the Rosicrucians, quote, Beneath the broad tide of human history, there flow the stealthy undercurrents of the secret societies, which frequently determine in the depths the changes that take place upon the surface. These societies have existed in all ages and among all nations, and tradition has invariably ascribed to them the possession of important knowledge in the religious, scientific, or political order according to the various character of their pretensions." Unquote. The official Freemasonic Scottish Rite magazine entitled The New Age Magazine admits that it is for a new world order, new world religion, and new age, quote, Great God our King has chosen the great American public schools to pave the way for the new race, the new religion, and the new civilization that is taking place in America. Any mother, father, or guardian who is responsible for the taking away of the freedom of mind, freedom of will, or freedom of spirit is the lowest criminal on earth, because they take away from that child the God-given right to become part of God's great plan in America for the dawn of the new age of the world. 33rd degree Freemason Manley Palmer Hall advocated world government, quote, The new Atlantis sets forth an ideal government of the earth. It foretells that day when in the midst of men there shall rise up a vast institution composed of the philosophic elect, an order of illumined men band together for the purpose of investigating the laws of life and the mysteries of the universe. The age of boundaries is closing and we are approaching a nobler era when nations shall be no more, when the lines of race and caste shall be wiped out, when the whole earth shall be under one order, one government, one administrative body." Unquote. Alice Bailey, the prominent theosophist, stated, quote, The new era is coming, the new ideals, the new civilization, the new modes of life, of education, of religious presentation, and of government are slowly precipitating and nothing can stop them. N. Sri Ram, a prominent theosophist and New World Order advocate stated, quote, Let us first consider the restoration of the mysteries. It is well known among members of the Co-Masonic movement that its work has been faithfully continued up to the present and that its number of lodges has steadily increased. I imagine that at such an auspicious time when the inner and outer worlds will have come much nearer together, some of the great leaders of the hierarchy might take part in the outer work of reconstruction and will then become the recognized leaders of the new world government." Unquote. Now this was written by Manly P. Hall. Manly P. Hall was both a grand master within Freemasonry and he was a grand master in the Illuminati. And he says, All of sincere heart will find consolation in the conviction that powers beyond and above human corruption continue to administer the destiny of the globe. It would be a mistake to confuse the governing bodies with the various sects which pretend to authority but give no indication or proof that they can manage efficiently even their own affairs. Now Manly P. Hall knows who he's referring to here because he's part of that secret body. But of course he speaks positively of it. The Zeitgeist films and movement have more ties to Theosophy and Freemasonry. At just two minutes into the second Zeitgeist film, Zeitgeist Addendum, a lecture of a man by the name of Jiddu Krishnamurti is played. Jiddu spent much of his childhood in southern India. Jiddu's father was a member of the Theosophical Society in southern India. 
When Jiddu was a boy, he was discovered by the Theosophist C.W. Ledbetter. Ledbetter was a man who was brought up on charges of immoral behavior with young boys, yet he still had a close relationship with the president of Theosophy, Annie Besant. Ledbetter and Besant would adopt Jiddu and take him to England. They raised him and brainwashed him into the Theosophic esoteric teachings. They were convinced that he was their return of the Christ and that he would lead humanity into the age of Aquarius as the world teacher for the new age. Jiddu thought he was the Christ for many years due to being brainwashed and he would give lectures speaking with authority on esoteric and occult matters. However, Jiddu became reluctant and after many years decided not to be the Christ of Theosophy. He was a false Christ and he later departed from Theosophy. He did retain connection with Theosophists and devoted the later part of his life to giving lectures on New Age spirituality. He authored many books on the subject as well. The fact that Zeitgeist would include this man in their film, knowing his deep connection with Theosophy, should demonstrate to everyone the New Age esoteric nature of the Zeitgeist films and movement. One of the main claims of Zeitgeist is that the gospel story of Jesus is derived from the stories of previous pagan gods. They attempt to draw parallels between Jesus and these other gods to try to show that the story of Jesus is just a copycat story. Subsequently, these claims have all been debunked by scholars and historians. Zeitgeist appealed to Acharya S. for this theory. These claims can be found in her book, The Christ Conspiracy. Interestingly, it was the founder of Theosophy, Helena Blavatsky, and the Marxist Theosophist, Annie Besant, who popularized these types of arguments and inserted them into the New Age movement. The emphasis is removing uniqueness from Jesus Christ and Christianity because to the New Ager, humanity is leaving Jesus' age of Pisces, which they believe is now evil. According to them, many people are still stuck believing in Christianity, holding the world back from their new spirituality. So what better way to fix this problem than to discredit the avatar of the previous Piscean age, Jesus Christ? They will even go as far as to say Jesus never existed in order to lead people away from Christianity. Thus the masses are now on board with the new Aquarian world order. Even modern New Agers around today will utilize this deception. New Age spokesman and disciple of Alice Bailey in Theosophy, Benjamin Krem states, quote, The five major initiations which take one to liberation have their symbolic enactment in the life of Jesus. That is what the gospel story is really about. It is a very ancient story and has been presented to mankind again and again in different forms long before the time of Jesus." Unquote. When one compares Acharya S.'s book The Christ Conspiracy to Helena Blavatsky's book Isis Unveiled Volume 2, it becomes quite clear where Acharya got much of her material. For extensive rebuttals to this copycat thesis, see the following books, videos, and articles. The three things that Zeitgeist adopts from Theosophy and Freemasonry with respect to theology are 1. The belief that the story of Jesus was copied from other religions. 2. That Jesus is a representation of the Son. And 3. That Jesus ushered in the age of Pisces. It makes sense why Theosophists would spread these views because they want a world system for the age of Aquarius and in discrediting Christianity and connecting Jesus to astrology, they can get apostate Christians on board. But why then does Zeitgeist spread this propaganda? Interestingly, the creator of Zeitgeist, Peter Joseph, has wanted a world system or utopia paradise on earth since the release of the first Zeitgeist film. And as far as the spiritual aspect of life, you know, we're all pure spirituality. Of course there's something outside of understanding because we're only, we're just a fragment inside this larger whole. I end Zeitgeist with a very positive note. We're talking about the the consciousness, the whole consciousness, because you can scientifically orient yourself and, and even more importantly, spiritually orient, orient yourself into a collective consciousness to realize that we're all one organism. And the moment people stop dividing themselves up and generating religious division, political division, the moment they stop, people stop fighting amongst themselves is the moment paradise will dawn. Similarly, Zeitgeist's main source, Acharya S., has advocated the New Age of Aquarius that the elitist theosophists and Freemasons await in her 1999 work, The Christ Conspiracy, quote, But the future is now, and the maneuvers are being unveiled. 
As far as Christianity's role in this new age, Carpenter states, quote, Christianity, therefore, as I say, must either now come frankly forward and acknowledge its parentage from the great order of the past, seek to rehabilitate that, and carry mankind one step forward in the path of evolution, or else it must perish. There is no alternative. Despite the vilification of the so-called New Age movement, the fact is that we are entering into a new age. The age referred to in the Gospel tale is that of Pisces, and through contrivance and duplicity, coercion and slaughter, the fish god Jesus, the Piscean solar avatar, has indeed been with us, but now it is the close of the age, and his time is over. As Hancock says, we live today in an astrological no man's land, at the end of the age of Pisces, on the threshold of the new age of Aquarius. Traditionally, these times of transition between one age and the next have been regarded as ill-omened, ill-omened verily as the ongoing destruction of the earth and the endless warfare over ideology will indeed produce the Armageddon so long awaited and planned by those who cannot live for today but must look towards an afterlife. By realizing the cultural unity revealed behind the Christ conspiracy, however, humanity can pull together and prevent this fall to create a better world. 75 years before Zeitgeist's main source Acharya S. penned that admission, the former president of Theosophy, Annie Besant, wrote something almost exactly the same, quote, The equinox will reach the sign of Aquarius, coinciding the great cycle of influence. We can indeed hope to put a complete end to all the influence of the past cycle, with its tyranny, slavery, war, and cruelty. This is one of the great transitional epochs, and the karma before humanity as a whole, and to every group in particular, is to reform itself from slavery, female subjection, war and cruelty, and establish a civilization based on humanness and interest in spiritual matters. New Age author Gail Fairfield explains what is expected for the supposed upcoming age of Aquarius. She states, quote, The sign of Aquarius is the sign of focused concepts. It concentrates intently on developing its ideas and then applies them to the betterment of humankind. It has talent for rapidly correlating all the information available into a political, ethical, spiritual, technological system. Aquarius creates optimal features for individuals and for humanity because it needs alternatives, possibilities, and something to move towards. Overall, Aquarius is a reformer and visionary working to create its utopia." Unquote. Isn't it interesting that right after Zeitgeist promoted the Aquarian New Age concepts in the first Zeitgeist film, the second film, Zeitgeist Addendum, then goes on to convince its followers to strive for a similar Aquarian one world system, new world order called the Venus Project. Indeed, the solution offered by the film Zeitgeist Addendum is that humanity needs to unite into the very same thing that Theosophy and Freemasonry wants it to unite into, a one world universal esoteric brotherhood of humanity a new world order. I think that the coming new system that the occultists and speak of um, is it's really crucial to understand that what they're talking about is not going to look like what we think the new world orders control grid will look like. They believe that the utopia will be one uh, uh, of a spiritual utopia, one that's free of wars and religion. It's, it's easy for a lot of people to have idealistic views about it. They're going to make it sound wonderful, uh, which is what like the zeitgeist addendum particularly does in the second part, where they talk about, oh, we're going to, um, we're going to like you know, have free energy. We're going to provide your needs. Uh, there's been talk about erasing all debts. That's more the, the Venus Project is more what, uh, is it Jacques Vallée? Jacques Fresco. Jacques Fresco. That's more what he's into, okay? This is, this is his utopian approach to um, the New World Order, where I literally heard him say on the addendum where he said, we'll have no laws. All laws will be done away with. I thought to myself, all laws. I mean, nobody's gonna have to work. It's just gonna sound like wonderful. I mean, he's talking about how are people gonna make movies? Well, you won't have to, and you can do whatever you want. And if you make a painting, you can give it to some. I mean, this this utopian world, but it's going to come at an extremely high price regarding the mark of the beast. It's not going to be what they're, they're cracking it up to be. And most likely, it's only going to come with massive depopulation. And they're going to probably try to pull that off a number of different ways. But you have the zeitgeist 
uh, this utopian approach, and then you also have the way the ascended master, some of the ascended masters say, will be done through a pro through a uh, project called Nasera, which you know is very similar in what the zeitgeist zeitgeist addenda talks about. It's just kind of a different flavor of it all. So, which one they're actually going to be able to pull off? It's up if the Lord lets them do it. Um, it's kind of up to the Lord. I, it's hard to say which way it'll go. Which one they're actually going to be able to pull off? It's up if the Lord lets them do it. Um, it's kind of up to the Lord. I, it's hard to say which way it'll go. The Venus Project looks like um, Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. This concept that has been with uh, the occult realm for a long time, uh, whether they call it the New Atlantis or whether they call it some coming utopia or the you know some Platonic um, version of the new age, the new world order, a lot of people, those terms were viewed uh, in a completely different context that I think a lot of us in the truth movement see the new world order. It's a totally different thing that they're hoping will happen. And I think that we can be in danger if we think that the new world order is just going to be a, a police state control grid, which I think it will be, but I think it will be in the context of a lot of uh, supernatural things going on. So it's going to look like the old, order, old, old world, world order is gone. And in doing so, it's going to be exactly what those like Francis Bacon and, and, and all the others have, uh, have mentioned. This new world order is going to be proposed to look just like the Venus Project. But I can tell you that that, that, that won't be the case for very long. It might be right at the beginning, but, but not as it goes on. According to the New Agers, Theosophists, as well as many elitists and Freemasons, there exists a group of highly evolved men and women called the Masters of Wisdom. These powerful groups claim that Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, and Jesus were all Masters of Wisdom, and that a being named Maitreya is the leader of these beings, who in turn is subject to the true leader, Sanat Kumra. New Age Theosophist Dane Rudhar concedes that the leader of the masters, Sanat Kumra, is in fact Satan, according to the esotericists. Quote, Satan is an anagram for Sanat Kumra, who in the esoteric philosophy of India is the Promethean being who gave mankind the fire of self-conscious and independent individual selfhood. Unquote. John Michael Greer in the New Encyclopedia of the Occult notes, quote, Satan has a possible echo in theosophic lore, where the Lord of the world, the spiritual ruler of the earth, and the head of the great white lodge is Sanat Kumra, a lord of the flame who descended to earth from Venus in a fiery chariot some six million years ago." Unquote. Helena Blavatsky taught her students that it is actually Satan who is God, the Messiah, and that Jehovah is the evil one. She stated, quote, it is but natural, even from the dead letter standpoint, to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. For it is he who was the harborer of light, bright radiant Lucifer, who opened the eyes of the automation created by Jehovah, as alleged, and he who was the first to whisper, In the day ye eat thereof, ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil, can only be regarded in the light of a savior, an adversary to Jehovah, the personating spirit. He still remains in esoteric truth, the ever-loving messenger, the angel, the seraphim and cherubim, who both knew well and loved still more, and who conferred on us spiritual instead of physical immortality. The theosophist H. Alexander Fusel seeks to deify Satan, quote, Satan, then, was originally a divine being destined to carry light and life to the netherworlds. He stands for the gift of free will and self-conscious mind to man, a power which at once seduces and uplifts man, for with free will comes the power to go astray. Satan is therefore man's teacher." Unquote. Once you are willing to give worship to Satan is when you are given a certain kind of power that the deceived, those that are just thinking it's them or thinking that something else can't have access to. So Freemasonry is a, is a systematic way to get people to that level without, uh, without actually just coming out and saying it right at first. One of the former leaders of the Theosophical Society, who was contemporary with Blavatsky and Annie Besant, tells us what the 19th century position on Satan is. In his work Spiritualism, Madame Blavatsky and Theosophy, Rudolf Steiner states, quote, 
Lucifer is not a being that we can see with our present day physical eyes. Lucifer can be seen only with the awakened clairvoyance. Seen clairvoyantly, in fact, Lucifer is a particular being who was left behind during the moon phase of evolution." Unquote. N. Sri Ram, who often gave lectures at the United Nations, a major theosophist and writer for Lucifer magazine, clarifies, quote, The adversary, or Satan, is no other than Lucifer, the light bearer, the bright morning star. He is the initiator, awakening the divine faculties of intellect on man. He is the king of the fallen angels, spirits from higher spheres, who descended among primitive mankind of the third race to develop in man and endow him with his self-conscious mind or manis." Unquote. Theosophy teaches that Satan or Lucifer is actually a divine being who saves humankind and brings him consciousness. Many modern influential New Agers who were deceived by Theosophy repeat the same theme. David Spangler admits that Lucifer is a being that New Agers honor and the light of Lucifer is the light of God. Quote, the true light of Lucifer cannot be seen through sorrow, through darkness, through rejection. The true light of this great being can only be recognized when one's own eyes can see with the light of the Christ, the light of the inner sun. Lucifer works within each of us trying to bring us to wholeness. And as we move into a new age, which is the age of man's wholeness, each of us in some way is brought to that point which I term the Luciferic initiation the particular doorway through which the individual must pass if he is to come fully into the presence of his light and his wholeness. Lucifer comes to give us the final gift of wholeness. If we accept it, then he is free and we are free. That is the Luciferic initiation. It is one that many people now and in the days ahead will be facing, for it is an initiation into the new age. It is an initiation of leaving the past and moving into the new shedding our guilts and fears, our anxieties, our needs, our temptations, and becoming whole and at peace because we have recognized our inner light and the light that enfolds us, the light of God." Unquote. So indeed the Luciferian doctrine is fused into the New Age movement due to Theosophy. Along with this doctrine is the belief that because of Satan, man is now thinking, he will evolve, conquer the world, conquer nature, and become a god. The Freemason W. L. Wilmhurst bolstered the fact that Freemasonry is aimed at creating God-men. The purpose of initiation is attaining Godhood, he states, quote, The height of the Lodge, even as high as the heavens, implies the range of consciousness possible to us. When we have developed our potentialities to the full is infinite. Man who has sprung from the earth and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature to his present rational state has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a godlike being and unifying his consciousness with the omniscient to promote which is and always has been the sole aim and purpose of all initiation." Unquote. Danny and Englewood, you're on the air, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, you're going to take this the wrong way, Peter J, director of the Zeitgeist, but uh, what you just said sounds exactly like Satanism, not saying that you are a satanic. I don't believe in Satanism. You, if you want to use that word, you know that's your own idea. You know what Satanism is? Atheists. People who do not believe in a God. People who believe that man is a God. That's yeah, that's correct. Is. You are God. Okay, then you are a Satanist. You are God. You are God. You are God. Okay, uh, can you tell us about Benjamin Krem, uh, Maitreya, and the Ascended Masters? Okay, well, Benjamin Krem was born in 1922, and uh, in 1959 he was contacted by one of the uh, Masters, uh, Ascended Masters. They don't really get real specific who actually contacted him first, but uh, what they did is, is asked him if he wanted to participate in this coming, uh, where he would actually talk about and be kind of like the John the Baptist for becoming uh, Maitreya, as they called him. And he accepted, and in 1975, he started Share International, which is kind of like the mouthpiece for uh, who they call Lord Maitreya. And in 1977, Maitreya actually made, according to them, 
his physical appearance, where he, he came from Himalaya, the Himalayas, and uh, supposedly he occupied a body, came in uh, on a plane from the Himalayas, and they even used that whole thing about him coming from the Himalayas in 1977 to say that this fulfills the Bible scriptures where it said he, he will come in the clouds, which is such a joke. But um, So Matre has really been, uh, or Benjamin Krem has really been like, again, the um, kind of like the, uh, like the false version of John the Baptist for Matreya ever since really. He's went around, lectured, um, he, he lectures at, at different and various occult groups. He lectures with at Masonic halls and these types of things, places where he feels comfortable at. And um, he's been trying to herald in uh, Maitreya for a long time. They've made many predictions where, you know, they said, okay, he's most likely going to appear within this time frame. And most of the time, they've just got everything wrong. So uh, they'll say, well, he could appear any moment, but we don't really know when. The New Age religion, folks, is going to have a worldwide leader, a charismatic political and religious leader that they call Lord Maitreya. At least so far, that's who they call him, or that's what they call him. This individual, as far as I know, has not made his public appearance yet, but the New Agers claim that he is on the earth at the present time. They claim that he came to live with the Asian community in East London, England, in July 1977 by descending from his ancient retreat in the Himalaya Mountains along the border of India and Tibet. They further believe that his imminent emergence into full public view is assured. They also claim that this individual is the one that the Christians call Christ, the Jews call the Messiah, the Buddhists call the Fifth Buddha, the Hindus call Krishna, and the Muslims called the Imam Mahdi. In other words, all of the major religions of the world are awaiting the arrival of this one individual. And they say that he is on the earth now, patiently waiting for the appointed time to reveal his existence to the peoples of the world. They say that he will apparently assume the leadership of all of these religions, and when he does, he will create a one world religion. The New Agers have written that in the esoteric tradition previously defined as being intended for or understood by only a choos chosen few as an inner group of disciples or initiates, in other words, the esoteric means hidden. They claim that the word Christ is not the name of an individual, but the name of an office or function within the spiritual hierarchy of masters. They claim that the masters are a group of perfected men who have guided human evolution from behind the scenes for centuries, and they believe that this Lord Maitreya is that Christ. Now, Manly P. Hall has written of this individual by identifying him as, quote, the way, the truth, and the life, which coming to every life redeems all who accept it, unquote. Since Jiddu Krishnamurti, featured in Zeitgeist Addendum, failed as the world teacher responsible for ushering in the age of Aquarius one world system, theosophists, Freemasons, and occultists have been waiting for their world teacher since then. Well, on January 9, 1959, a student of Alice Bailey and Blavatsky, who was already familiar with the doctrine of the Ascended Masters, Benjamin Krem, would come into contact with powerful forces who would appoint him to introduce Maitreya, the world teacher, to humanity. Krem's first experience is as follows. On January 3rd, 1959, Krem became possessed by an energy and a message from an outside force said to him, go to Blackfair's Bridge, south side, Blackheath side, on January 9th, 9.30 p.m. So on January 9th, 1959, Benjamin Krem followed these instructions and crossed Blackfair's Bridge in London, walking to the south side. There was no one about. It was deserted. There was a car waiting at the far end of the bridge. He walked beside the car and looked inside of it. There were some people in it who he did not know, but one of them was a man who told him he had been receiving messages from the Ascended Masters. From there, Krem started receiving messages again from this force who he now believed were these Ascended Masters that Theosophy invented. This entity told Krem to pull out his tape recorder. It began giving Krem long dictations, which he repeated into the tape recorder. 
The entity said, Now our master Maitreya himself has something important to tell you. Krem then claimed to be overshadowed by Maitreya, this leader of the Ascended Masters. In a sense, he was possessed by Maitreya. Krem claims that the experience was that of total identification with everything and everybody in the world, a kind of universal experience such as he had never felt. He was filled with a foreign tremendous energy. Krem claimed to have seen a vision of himself in the future, as well as Maitreya, the world teacher, who ushers in the age of Aquarius, one world system. Later he was instructed that he would help introduce Maitreya to the world. Since then, Krem started an organization called Share International. They have a website as well. It is aimed at promoting Maitreya and the teachings of Theosophy and the New Age. Krem admitted that he was influenced by Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey, quote, To many today, this awareness includes the recognition of higher states of consciousness attained by those who make up the emerging spiritual kingdom, the masters and initiates of the world. Their existence was first revealed in modern time by H.P. Blavatsky, co-founder of the Theosophical Society, as long ago as 1875. A more detailed communication about the Masters and their work was given by Alice A. Bailey between 1919 and 1949. In her book, The Externalization of the Hierarchy, she revealed the existence of a planned return to physical plane work and activity by this group of enlightened men, which return, I submit, has already begun. I think that what Blavatsky wrote down, even by her own admission, was not written by uh, a ascended master and I don't think that ascended masters exist she was being deceived regardless of what we think we have to we have to at least believe her and the others involved in the high levels of the theosophic movement that what they got the core levels their secret doctrine was given to them by off-world entities the the research becomes who are these off-world entities and this is the other part of that research is what those entities said true or not I understand that it's very poetic, it's very easy and seductive to uh, believe because when you read some of her stuff or some of the other stuff that's written directly from demonic entities, it's extremely seductive. We must understand that these beings are thousands of years older than us and they're very smart. We're no match for them. The, most, the smartest of us are no match for the intellect of them, but their des desire is to deceive us. So we are outmatched in this regard. So that's why it's seductive when we read it. Um, the most current thing that they're doing right now has been since last December, this supposed uh, star sign, which is really, again, they just try to knock off from the Bible as much as they possibly can. This is like a knockoff of the star of uh, Bethlehem in the Bible. And in that, they're saying that there's going to be these, what they call star-like luminaries in the sky. Four of them, that are in different quadrants of the earth. Um, they're five times the size of a football field, according to them. And people are seeing these things, and they've got a whole, up on shareinternational.org, they've got a whole um, section devoted to this, where people are sending in pictures, there's stars, and, and what they are, spaceships. And that's what they're, that's what they're uh, admitting to at this point. And more and more people are seeing them, but evidently this is going to be the thing that really, really heralds in Maitreya up until they have the day of declaration when he makes his public emergence. And this is supposed to be on the uh, major media? <laughs> yes, yes. When he makes his uh, big debut, uh, what they've said is they've already secured an interview with a major uh, U.S. TV network, and then one in Japan, I believe, as well. Uh, so during this time, he's going to, uh, the day of declaration, Supposedly, he's going to basically telepathically communicate with masses and masses of people. They supposedly will hear them in their own language. They'll be able to comprehend him. Supposedly, they'll feel this infinite love. Uh, and um, there will be many also supposed miraculous healings taking place around the world at the same time. And most likely, this day of declaration will come on the heels of some or multiple cataclysmic events, most likely the first thing being an economic meltdown, which is what he's predicted back, way back from the 90s. And what does Maitreya uh, promise? What does he want to achieve? What are his goals? Well, you know, if you look at the word Share International, which is the name of the site, you know, he, if you, if you read what he says, um, he wants 
the world resource sharing of the world. He doesn't want there to be any, uh, supposedly, any uh, inequalities of the world. You know, you look at what he says that he is. He says that he is the Christ that the Christians are expecting, uh, the Messiah the Jews are expecting, the fifth Buddha the, Buddhas are, the Buddhists are expecting, uh, Krishna the Hindus are expecting, and Imam Mahdi that the Muslims. So he's kind of everything rolled up into one. He's, he's, he's like the total package. He's going to give and be able to unite and put all of the various and different religious systems, the major religious systems, all on the same page. And the Bible says that when the Antichrist comes, he's going to come with all lying power, signs, and wonders. And he's going to see the, deceive the whole world by which the miracles that he's going to do. So he's taking credit for every single miracle that's going on right now. Whether it's a Marian apparition, whether, which would be to him the ascended master Mary, because he's got a whole band of masters that he's going to be coming with. And so he's, he's taking credit for everything. Every miracle that you're seeing going on in the world right now, whether it's a Catholic miracle, whether it's some type of energizing of the water, whether it's some bleeding statue, whether it's, you know, some Hindu miracle, crosses of light, they've seen those in different and various churches. He's taking credit for all of that. And I think what we're going to see and what, what he says we're going to see, in fact, I just read this in their last report, Benjamin Kremitz said also with the UFO sightings, he says they're going to increase up until the time when he makes his emergence. And he is going to be, he's going to come on the scene. He's going to be able to explain all of this and try to put everything, everybody on the same page. My personal belief is that the Antichrist or the world teacher will um, seem to actually be Christ in the sense that he will seem to destroy uh, some old system and some old bad leader. And I think that it will somehow be tied to... Um, I don't know. I, I, this is my guess, but it will somehow be tied to some sort of fake or uh, alien invasion or presence of some sort. I don't know if Maitreya fits all those um, those characteristics, but uh, I wouldn't doubt it for one minute if if he was. My personal opinion is that uh, Krim is somebody who ha is being talked to by entities and is doing what he's told to be doing. But you have to understand a lot of times with people that are channeling entities like that. They, they oftentimes do, do and say things that don't come true because the demons themselves don't know when. They're still on a timeline that they can't, they can't tell when something's going to happen. So they're always keeping something ready to happen in case when they finally can. So in the case of, uh, of that, like if you look at the Blossom Goodchild thing and these ideas that were consistently put out by channel entities and things, uh, it never came to pass because they don't have control over the timeline. They just have to always be ready. According to Share International and the Swahili edition of the Kenya Times, Maitreya made an appearance June 11, 1988 to a local congregation in Nairobi, Kenya. The editor of the Swahili edition of the Kenya Times, a veteran journalist named Job Matungi, witnessed the event and took some pictures. A summary of his article as it appeared in his newspaper is as follows, quote, The tall figure of a barefooted white-robed and bearded man appeared from nowhere and stood in the middle of the crowd. He was walking slowly towards the new church building away from the tent. Mary walked with him side by side. I stared at the stranger without blinking, wafted on top of his turbaned head, his feet and his entire body. In clear Swahili, which had no traces of accent, the strange man announced that the people of Kenya were blessed, especially those who had gathered at the venue that afternoon. We are nearing the time of the reign of heaven, but before that I shall come back and bring a bucket full of blessings for all of you, the man said. A bucket full of blessings is a reference to the astrological symbol for the age of Aquarius. Aquarius is depicted as a man carrying a pitcher of water in the zodiac, but continuing with the article, quote, It took the crowd nearly 20 minutes to recover after the man left the meeting in a car belonging to a Mr. Gurnam Singh who offered to give him a lift, but it will probably take Mr. Singh his lifetime to recover from the shock he got two minutes later. On reaching the bus terminus, the man informed Mr. Singh to stop the car. On getting out, he walked a few paces beside the road and simply vanished into thin air. New Age expert and attorney Constance Cumbie, author of The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, had stumbled onto this Maitreya figure in her research in the 80s. 
Her book, published in 1983, was the first book to give a full expose on Maitreya and Benjamin Krem. On page 21, she notes a Denver Post interview conducted by Jack Kisling speaking to Benjamin Krem, quote, Won't the advent of a single world religion annoy the hierarchies of all the current orthodox religions, I asked? More than that, he said with a smile. They will be shocked, I dare say. They will be among the last to accept the Christ. But according to Kisling, Krem said confidently, It will come, because it must. We will begin to live, he said, as potential gods." Unquote. Constance Cumbie also notes that Krim is a Luciferian by citing a WLAC radio interview, quote, In a November 9, 1982 radio interview over WLAC, Nashville, Benjamin Krim told the entire Bible Belt that Lucifer came to planet Earth from planet Venus 18 and a half million years ago and made the supreme sacrifice for us." Unquote. Constance Cumby had direct contact with Benjamin Krem face to face in Detroit, Michigan. I had the opportunity to meet this brave woman and she showed me the place in which she had attended a lecture by Benjamin Krem. to a packed crowd, November 4th, 1981, and Bread for the World was out there, head tables, Oxfam, every group you could think of was sitting out there. They were passing out brochures. The brochure is reproduced in both of my books. Benjamin Krem came in. He opened, he gave some kind of a hand signal that looked something like that. And I thought at first he was waving to somebody, but the crowd appeared to flip into a trance. And then he started speaking and he was rotating his head. I can't even come close to, it was as close to a 180 degree spin of a head as I've ever seen. How his head didn't snap off, I'll never know. And then he started talking and laying out what they were doing and the crowd was thoroughly under several degrees of hypnosis. I knew many people in that crowd the, from political circles and social circles in Detroit for many years. And I talked to some of them. And the common denominator was they had all been through one kind of mind control course or another, one type of new age class or another. I talked to a fellow behind me, Al Banks, and I said he was a film producer doing much of what you're doing now. And I said, Al, I know what I'm doing here tonight. What are you doing here? And he said, because, Connie, he said, I'm taking a course in miracles at Unity. He said, I've joined Unity. We're all required to take a spiritual growth class. I've taken a course in miracles. It was a class requirement that we be here tonight. And then he said, you know, Connie, I would have thought a progressive person like you would have joined Unity a long time ago. Well, then I started explaining to him exactly why I haven't. And he, like, snapped, the glaze snapped off his eyes for a little bit. He thanked me for telling him. And then Krem came in and started doing his thing. And at the end of the evening, they had been promised a, uh, an appearance by Maitreya, the Christ channeled through Benjamin Krem himself, that Maitreya would speak through Benjamin Krem. And Benjamin Krem asked everybody to join in the recitation of the Great Invocation. I told the woman standing next to me, I will not say the Great Invocation with you. I will say my own prayer. And she was a nice little prim, proper looking black lady. Could have been active in any black Baptist church in Detroit from her appearance. And she said, no, that's all right, honey. We all have our own paths to God. And I said, the reason I will not say the great invocation with you, the scriptures clearly said that the Antichrist would come denying that Jesus was the Christ. I said, Benjamin Krem has denied it all evening and said Jesus was not the Christ and this Maitreya was. And the woman said what Benjamin Krem had said. She said, there's been many Christs. I said, there's been one and his name is Jesus. And people turned from rows around and looked at me like I was crazy. And 
And so then Benjamin Krem came in and he started the hundred and nearly close to 180 degree spin of his neck again. And the crowd, crowd's hypnotic trance appeared to deepen and he started out from the point of light within the mind of God, may light spring forth ever. And I went nice and clear and I'll tell you the acoustics in that building are wonderful. I said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I did that each and every stanza. And they got down to the last part, said, May light and love and power fulfill thee plan on earth, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. And I said, nice and loud and clear, I said, May Jesus Christ return to earth and end the evil present in this room tonight. Well, the funniest thing happened, or may I say, it did not happen. Benjamin Krem stood there. He waited, he waited, and he waited. He clearly was watching for something to come over him. And it didn't happen. And he finally said to the crowd, he said, that will be all. You are dismissed. And, of course, everybody was extremely disappointed. And we went to the door and I went walking out. I had brought some co-spies with me. They were kind of chickening out at that point and waiting for me. They were afraid of being ripped limb to limb. And I stood down there and a number of those people knew me and they were just furious with me. And I stood there calm, cool, and collected. And I said, well, I said, if you're Maitreya the Christ, Betreya the Christ, or whatever his name's supposed to be, we're everything he's cracked up to be. One lousy Christian in there saying the Lord's Prayer shouldn't have stopped him. And Benjamin Krem has never come back to Detroit although that was probably the most successful night financially and crowd-wise that he'd had in the United States. The following is a video taken in Iraq at a Shia Muslim festival. Share International and Benjamin Krem have put out that this is indeed an appearance of Maitreya, the supposed world teacher for the Age of Aquarius One World Government. Commenting on this video, Share International reports, quote, Imam Mahdi, unexpected appearance, proclaims the title of a video posted on YouTube. A miraculous figure of glowing brilliant white light appeared on a video filmed in Karbala, Iraq on the night of Ashura, 6 January 2008. This Shia Muslim ceremony commemorates the martyrdom of the grandson of the Prophet Hussein, whose tomb is in Karbala. Benjamin Krem's master confirms that the light figure is Maitreya, Imam Mahdi to the Muslims and that his dance-like movements with a sword remind us of his coming with the sword of cleavage. Could this be real, or is it a hoax? Is Maitreya real, or is he a hoax? Whatever the case may be, it turns out that it is not only New Agers and occultists who believe in this Maitreya, but politicians, presidents, and elitists also follow Maitreya. Wayne Peterson, a retired American diplomat, and admitted supporter of Maitreya with connections to the Pentagon and the United Nations, stated the following about Mikhail Gorbachev in the White House in a Vision magazine interview, June 20, 2000. Reporter Kendall Klug asks, I believe Mikhail Gorbachev has publicly stated his belief of the existence of Maitreya. Do you know if this is true? Wayne Peterson answers, I have one little story I could tell you about Gorbachev. A friend of mine who has worked with the World Bank went to the Heads of State Conference in Europe and gave a speech where he borrowed many of Maitreya's ideas for economic reform out of a book by Benjamin Krem that I had given him. He told me that he had read the book on his flight to Europe and realized that his keynote address to these world officials, especially presidents and prime ministers, it was a very high-level meeting, was going to be very boring with many having heard similar sentiments over and over so he thought he would throw in some of Maitreya's ideas into the speech. The country he was in had a reigning monarch who invited him to lunch the next day. When he showed up for lunch, there were 16 to 20 people there, including Mr. Gorbachev. The monarch of this country said to my friend, I suppose you're wondering why we invited you here today. Well, we are all curious about where you got those ideas for your speech, which you presented yesterday. 
He said that my friend Wayne gave me a book written by Benjamin Krem about Maitreya's mission. Immediately they nodded their heads. We thought so, was the apparent response. That's why we invited you here. We all know of Maitreya, and we're doing what we can for him. But we are not able to say anything publicly, because we are world leaders. We each have our own public to deal with. Only one person there stood up and said that they could use his name to legitimize these sightings, and that was Mikhail Gorbachev. He was the only man in the room who would say, use my name if you want. The reporter asks, do you think President Clinton has had an experience with Maitreya? Wayne Peterson, I don't know if President Clinton has. I believe that former President Bush has. We used to have transmission meditation groups that Maitreya had asked us to do around Washington, D.C. People who were interested in Maitreya and the reappearance story would get together once a week in Georgetown, in the home of President Bush's main counselor at the White House. President Bush came over to this house for dinner one night, and the hostess was in the dining room as President Bush asked her, What do you think? I'm running against Clinton in this election. Am I going to win? She said, No, Mr. President, you are not. Maitreya has already said that you are going to lose to Clinton. Bush never challenged her, but merely said, Yeah, yeah. He didn't ask who Maitreya was. He was very quiet, and then said, I think I've got to go now. Benjamin Krim has said many times that he had heard from one of Maitreya's associates that Maitreya had appeared to Bush and that they had a discussion in the White House. So that incident with my meditation group seemed to confirm that Bush did in fact know of Maitreya. I do know people in the White House have been visited by Maitreya many times, and the people I'm talking I've seen on the front page of the Washington Post standing next to the President. In a December 19, 2008 London Telegraph article, Major Media Organization, Mick Brown praises Maitreya and Benjamin Krem, stating, quote, This week has come encouraging news for anyone with an interest in signs and wonders, or desperate for a chink of light in the prevailing gloom, which probably means most of us, a savior is at hand. I think even that, even that does not describe why the world has changed so much and why the world has turned so much toward a new world order and a new kind of civilization. Maitreya is one of the, the main uh, theosophy in Maitreya. Uh, the whole UN movement, the, the whole Lucius Trust movement, uh, world goodwill, uh, they're going out of the way to try to discredit it and say, well, you know, Jesus, all he really was was a disciple of Maitreya. He's still a disciple of Maitreya. Maitreya's over him, and Jesus, they believe what happened is, is Jesus heralded in the age of Pisces. Now what we're going to be doing is now we need to herald in the age of Aquarius. This is where the new world order comes in, and this is what Maitreya is going to bring. So we're going to de-emphasize Jesus, and we're going to move over to Maitreya. Jesus is just a disciple of um Maitreya anyway, according to them. In 1919, the Theosophist Alice Bailey was supposedly contacted by one of these ascended masters known as the Tibetan Dijwal Kul. From 1919 to 1949, Bailey would write 24 books, and according to her, she would do automatic writing, a New Age way of channeling and letting the Force write for you, Bailey would create Lucifer Publishing, which would distribute the works of Helena Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society. She would later change the name to Lucius Trust because Lucifer Publishing was too controversial. Lucius Trust evolved into a large New Age organization, and it is still active today. Lucius Trust is also directly associated with the United Nations. According to the United Nations International Geneva Yearbook 2009, quote, the Lucius Trust is recognized by the United Nations as a non-governmental organization and is represented at regular briefing sessions at UN headquarters. The Lucius Trust is on the roster of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Thus Theosophy and the New Age are now fused into the United Nations, which gives a medium for the New Age agenda to unfold. The aim of corrupt organizations like Lucius Trust and the UN is to create a one world government, new world order which is in accord with the supposed Age of Aquarius. 
many high-level elitists have voiced their approval for such a system. Donald Keyes is a high-level New Age leader. Humanity, says Keyes, is, quote, on the verge of something entirely new, a further evolutionary step unlike any other, the emergence of the first global civilization. David Rockefeller, the owner of the Chase Manhattan Bank, called for a new world order openly in his book memoirs, quote, For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents, such as my encounter with Castro, to attack the Rockefeller family for their inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it." Unquote. American foreign policy analyst and former Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot advocated globalization and world government in Time Magazine, July 20, 1992 edition. He remarks, quote, Here is one optimist's reason for believing unity will prevail over disunity, integration over disintegration. In fact, I'll bet within the next hundred years, I'm giving the world time for setbacks and myself to be out of the betting game, just in case I lose this one. Nationhood as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. A phrase briefly fashionable in the mid-20th century, citizen of the world, will have assumed real meaning by the end of the 21st. All countries are basically social arrangements, accommodations to changing circumstances. No matter how permanent and even sacred they may seem at any one time, in fact, they are all artificial and temporary." Unquote. Mikhail Gorbachev, previously noted, stated, quote, The threat of environmental crisis will be the international disaster key that will unlock the New World Order. Unquote. Gorbachev also remarked, quote, We are moving toward a New World Order, the world of communism. We shall never turn off that road. Unquote. New Ager and student of Alice Bailey, Robert Mueller, former Secretary General of the United Nations, gave this frightening admission, quote, We must move as quickly as possible to a one-world government, a one-world religion, under a one-world leader, unquote. The esoteric zeitgeist movement promotes a world system, resource-based economy, with absolutely no money. A technotronic society where machines play a big role. The zeitgeist movement seeks to grow out of capitalism, free markets, profit motive and scarcity, which they believe are responsible for aberrant behavior. Many people have concluded that the zeitgeist utopian system is socialistic and communistic. For example, after watching Zeitgeist Addendum, author and political lecturer G. Edward Griffin was convinced that zeitgeist is advocating a Marxist socialist world system. He states, quote, Perhaps the biggest insult to our intelligence is the main theme of the program. It is that profits are the root of all our problems today. That being the case, we must change mankind to reject profit, and we must work together on some other basis. It is never quite clear what that basis is, but whatever it is, it will be administered and directed by an elite group, at least in the beginning. I was stunned by the fact that this is pure Marxism. Marx theorized that people had to be re-educated in labor camps if necessary, to cleanse their minds of the profit motive. He and his disciples such as Lenin and Stalin and Khrushchev said that eventually the character of man would be purged of greed and then the state would wither away because it no longer would be needed. Sure, we saw that in the Soviet Union and China, right? Yet this Marxist nonsense is exactly what is offered in this video program. It is communism without using the name. The enemy of mankind is not profit. It is a political system of big government. Yet this program is supportive of some of the most notable big government collectivists on the planet. Marxist Leninists may be enemies of collectivists in Washington DC, but they are collectivists in their own right. The communist model is no better than the Nazi model. Samuel Adams, a patriotic founding father of America, repudiated communist and socialist ideas. The utopian schemes of leveling, redistribution of wealth, and a community of goods 
central ownership of the means of production and distribution, are as visionary and impractical as those which vest all property in the crown. These ideas are arbitrary, choices and actions which are done not by means of any underlying principle or logic, despotic, ruling with absolute political power, and in our government unconstitutional. When one does a comparison between Zeitgeist Addendum and the communist model, it becomes clear that Zeitgeist is in fact promoting communism. N. B. Godke, in the work Encyclopedic Dictionary of Economics, defines full communism based on the ideals of Marx and Engels and others as, quote, 1. Social wealth will be distributed according to human needs, meaning things that are scarce will be distributed first to those who need them the most. Zeitgeist proposes having an abundancy of resources and no scarcity, and thus the idea of distributing wealth according to human needs is rendered obsolete. On this point, they have merely updated the communist model by eliminating scarcity. 2. The state will wither away as there is no need for coercion. The state does nothing because there is no state. Because there is no state. 3. Social classes will not exist. Zeitgeist states, The process which has been going on for centuries, if not millennia, religion, patriotism, race, wealth, class, and every other form of arbitrary separatist identification thus conceived has served to create a controlled population utterly malleable in the hands of the few. 4. It will be a moneyless economy. Zeitgeist's associate Jacques Fresco states the system uses no money. 5. It will be a command economy. In other words, government planners decide which goods and services are produced and how they are distributed. According to Zeitgeist, distribution of goods and services without the use of money or tokens would be accomplished by establishing distribution centers. These centers would be similar to expositions, where the advantages of new products are explained and demonstrated. Exhibition centers will display what is new and available and will constantly be updated. So as you can see, a side-by-side -side comparison between the communist model and the Zeitgeist model shows how similar the concepts are. The Marxist website entitled Socialism or Your Money Back .blogspot.com, after reviewing the Zeitgeist movement and their admissions, stated this on July 26, 2009, quote, This, surely, is the same as what we call world socialism, unquote. So even the socialists will admit that the Zeitgeist movement is in fact world socialism. Adam Zwas explains, quote, Communism and the Marxist utopia of a moneyless society where products were distributed rather than sold and bought, unquote. Zeitgeist's main source, Acharya S., promoted the founder of communism, Karl Marx, on her website, it no longer looks like this, but using archive software, you can see how her website looked in the years past. She quotes Karl Marx defaming religion, thus showing her support of Marx and communism. Many people have noticed that the modern New World Order, as advocated by the elite, contains communist ideals within it. So it seems that Zeitgeist is helping the New World Order with their utopian approach rather than destroying it. They had a biblical philosophy. They gave us a republic. When Ben Franklin walked out of the building, one of the ladies said, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government did you give us? He said, a republic, if you can keep it. Republics are hard to keep. We've lost ours, folks. We are not a republic anymore. We have degenerated to a democracy, and the next step is totalitarianism. We're that close to becoming a totally socialistic and then communistic country in America. You watch, it's going to happen real soon. What they're going to do next time is manufacture a depression, coming real soon probably, collapse the U.S. economy, which can easily be done overnight. And then everybody will line up and say, oh, hey, we're starving. What can we do? We're going to say, you know, we, we really got a problem. We need to solve this. Constance Cumbie recognized that the New Agers desire a communist world system, quote, the New Agers feel that the program they are offering the world would satisfy the basic desire of communists in that it proposes a form of world socialism. These books were calling for a new world order with an accompanying global food redistribution program aided, of course, by modern technology, i.e. computers." Unquote. 
A redistribution program aided by modern technology and computers is exactly what the Zeitgeist movement is advocating. Notice how similar Zeitgeist's plan is to the New Age agenda just mentioned in Constance Cumbie's book and the Zeitgeist orientation lecture Peter Joseph states. Just as each city has a central organizational dome which functions as the brain along with its nervous system consisting of computerized environmental monitoring via satellite and electronic probes, the larger world complex absorbs each city and monitors the broad spectrum of the environment, making sure there isn't a problem or material resource needed in any of the individual cities, while also regulating larger order processes for all the cities and the environment as a whole. As a whole. Theosophist Alice Bailey concurs, quote, The true communist platform is sound. Thus, it is not surprising why Zeitgeist advocates a similar system, as the connection they have to Theosophy and the New Age has already been established. Zeitgeist is merely the fulfillment of the New Age agenda, yet they are not telling you that. So the Theosophists and New World Order advocates would love nothing more than for people to join the Zeitgeist movement. In fact, at 47 minutes and 25 seconds into the Zeitgeist orientation lecture, Peter Joseph cites a quotation of Carl Pearson. What is interesting is that the man that Joseph admiringly appeals to to support his worldview, Carl Pearson, was a notorious eugenicist and social Darwinist who advocated war against certain races. He was a socialist and contemporary of Karl Marx. In fact, Theodore M. Porter in his work Carl Pearson, The Scientific Life in the Statistical Age states, quote, Pearson's appreciation of Marx was real especially in early 1881. In his first essay on socialism, he called Marx, quote, one of the most extraordinary characters which this century has produced, unquote. New World Order research involving lectures, radio addresses, and writing used to be conducted by people such as William Cooper, Fritz Springmeier, John Todd, Randall N. Baer, and Kent Hovind. The unifying factor in all of these people was that they were all Christians. They would expose the New World Order and its New Age Luciferian communist aims. They would promote belief in Jesus Christ and the Word of God and tell people to resist the mystery religions of Theosophy and Freemasonry while exposing them. However, all of these men have either been murdered or framed and jailed, silenced. William Cooper was shot dead in 2001 as he was ambushed. Fritz Springmeier was framed, discredited, and jailed. Randall and Bear had his car ran off of a mountain pass. John Todd was framed, discredited, jailed, and then murdered. Kent Hovind was singled out for tax evasion and then jailed. Okay, so Fritz Springmeier, uh, you knew him, right? Yes. Okay, uh, so you got some letters from him, is that? Yes, when Fritz, uh, when they put Fritz in prison, I mean, there's been, you know, he, it was pretty much a trumped up charge of, I think they, marijuana or something, talk of robbing a bank, this type of stuff. He got put in prison and uh, I started corresponding with him at that point because I had read several of his books and actually talked to him personally on several occasions. And we really, all we could do at that point is correspond. Right. So I've got several handwritten letters from him. And uh, the last time I had heard from him was several years back and uh, he had been in a, it wasn't his fault, uh, and I think it might have been arranged where um, he was in a fight, but he didn't fight back. Yeah. The guy came and he told me that he was just using his head like a soccer ball, essentially. Really? Oh, it was sad. Wow. It was sad. And you know, Fritz, he never complained in these letters. Yeah. He never, uh, it wasn't like he was like, oh, woe is me, I'm in prison and this or that. He always had a great attitude. He was trying to help other people in there. I believe he had a ministry going. Amen. And, um, you know, I, I can't say enough good about Fritz Springer. Now that the Christian New World Order researchers have been silenced, the truth movement has been infiltrated by people who purport to be against the New World Order, yet they advocate the New Age religion, a new utopia, and they all speak against Christianity and the Bible. The people who took over the truth movement and who are allowed to live and teach the public, such as Jordan Maxwell, Michael Tessarion, Peter Joseph, David Icke, and others, all of these people have one unifying factor. They are all strictly against Christianity, and they are all heavily associated with the New Age, Theosophy, and Freemasonry. 
I think Jordan Maxwell is somebody um, who is just deceived. It's my personal opinion, and I could be wrong about this, that Jordan Maxwell is not uh, a paid disinformation agent or he's not uh, somebody that is a high-level Satanist. I think that Jordan Maxwell is like many of us in the truth movement. Uh, we have uh, been deceived by a lot of very clever disinformation. In his case, Blavatsky and the Secret Doctrine and that whole concept that, that really got him on a roll. Jordan Maxwell um, is a person who believes that the entities that he's involved with, that he had experiences with in the desert, etc., were Pleiadians. And I think that he thinks that they chose him to uh, teach the world certain things. So in that context, it's very hard for him or really anybody to um, break free of that paradigm because in that paradigm, he gets to be this super special individual. And we all are, are uh, uh, vulnerable to that. If we have supernatural experiences where, where entities tell you that you are the chosen one and that you're going to do something, it's very hard not to believe them because that's what you want. And so it's very hard, uh, and, and of course, in doing so, in, in thinking, okay, these guys, these Pleiadians are on my side, when in actuality they're demons, they would coax him to do certain things, like he mentioned later, to go into uh, you know, these seances or whatever. In doing that, they can have more control over him, because they're demons and they have a, a, a system to get more control over a person. And if they do that, then he can uh, start to be used more thoroughly by them, and he can do exactly what he promised them that he would do, to be a channel for them. And that's what his life has been about, being used, despite his, uh, despite his pr probably very good intentions, he has been a tool of the New World Order. And so my, my view is um, that Jordan Maxwell's uh, ex it, it ends up promoting the New World Order. In that, particular, um, in that particular session, he goes on to say that the um, New World Order, uh, that a, a bad time is coming, but that time must come in order for it to be uh, uh, destroyed to bring the birth of the New World Order. Out of chaos comes order. So he was saying that the, the old system must be destroyed to come the new system. And that is exactly what uh, the double-headed phoenix rising out of the ashes is all about. The old system of the New World Order is what we see building up all around us. It is going to get really, really bad, and, and it, it, but it is going to be destroyed um, and in a sense uh, because it, that faucet is being run by evil. We all know that the things that are happening to the world right now are are being done because of evil. So if evil is causing all those things, evil can also turn that faucet off at just the right time in order to make it seem like whoever stopped it, stopped it and therefore is the savior. So that new system will seem like the utopia that Jordan Maxwell says we all need to wait for. It's interesting that he says that at that time is that that's when the, you know, the aliens or gods are coming back to say to stop it. That's the deception. That's what's. That's what the people in the um, have been saying of the occultists, saying that that's what the demons are going to do for a long time. It, it's it's easy to be seduced, especially in Tassarian's case, who was raised since 11 years old, saying that this is truth. He was raised by Rosicrucians, raised by um, these people by his own admission. He was doing the tarot cards at the age of 11 by his own biography. This is the example of being raised in a system, being told one thing is true and, and the other thing is is not. Um, it's, it's biased is what it is, but, but nevertheless, I don't want to, I think in that reason, these people deserve our sympathy. One way or the other, they are deceived. Even if they are intentionally doing it, which is possible in the case of Tassarian, and it's possible in the case of Maxwell too, I, I suppose, um, even if they're intentionally doing it, they have to deserve our um, sympathy and even our prayers, because even if they're intentionally doing it, they're still deceived. Uh, but, but to say, but to wrap that up, uh, Blavatsky and everything that came out of that was what First Timothy calls the doctrines of demons, and in the last days people will uh, believe. The New Age and all of that was birthed by Blavatsky, and the New Age ideas um, will be used to bring in this new world order. The negative impact of population growth on all of our planetary ecosystems is becoming appallingly evident. Unless nations will agree to work together to tackle these cross-border challenges posed by population growth, overconsumption of resources, and environmental degradation, the prospects for a decent life 
on our planet will be threatened. But this callous disregard for the right to life of every human on the face of the earth has been predicted before in the New Testament. John was moved to write, quote, Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service, unquote. The New World Order, ladies and gentlemen, will sail in on a sea of blood. The same New Agers who call for peace, love, harmony, and world unity, when confronted with separatists, for example, fundamentalist Christians, you start to see a darker side to them. They do not appreciate people who will not adopt their New Age views. For example, a major New Age figure, David Spangler, who was in a group known as uh, Planetary Citizens, which was a UN group, stated something to the effect of we can take all the marshmallows, all the scriptures, all the tablets and have a jolly good bonfire. So essentially he's promoting the abolition of these faiths. Similarly, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the influential New Age guru sought out by the Beatles, stated, quote, There has not been and there will not be a place for the unfit. The fit will lead and if the unfit are not coming along, there is no place for them. In the place where light dominates, there is no place for darkness. See, in his thinking, the fit are the New Agers, and the unfit are those who do not adopt the New Age beliefs. People who are, for example, fundamentalist Christians, Jews, people like this. So essentially, you see a lot of intolerance within the New Age movement. It's not all nice and dandy with these people. You know, they have the mask, they have the appearance of peace, love, harmony. But in, in their writings, they do come out and say that there is no place for Christians and people who do not accept their beliefs. In the book of co-creation, New Age leader Barbara Marks Hubbard states, quote, Out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend. One-fourth is resistant to election. They are unattracted by life ever-evolving. Now as we approach the quantum shift from creature-human to co-creative human, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately you, dearly beloveds, are not responsible for this act, we are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse, death. Alice Bailey explained what the New World Order will do to those who refuse to accept it, quote, let us never forget that it is the life, its purpose, and its directed, intentional destiny that is of importance, and also that when a form proves inadequate, or too diseased, or too crippled for the expression of that purpose, it is, from the point of view of the hierarchy, no disaster when that form has to go. Death is not a disaster to be feared. The work of the destroyer is not really cruel or undesirable. Therefore, there is much destruction permitted by the custodians of the plan, and much evil turned into good." Unquote. Blavatsky's peer, Aleister Crowley, said an Egyptian entity told him Christianity would be destroyed at the advent of the New Age. Quote, A peer of Blavatsky's, often called the prophet of the New Age, Aleister Crowley, claimed to have been visited in the spring of 1904 by an Egyptian entity called Oase who foretold to Crowley the end of Christianity, unquote. But if you dig deep into the literature, yes, they're going to be extremely intolerant. Um, David Spangler had talked about the Luciferic initiation and um, these types of things. And we look in the Bible and we can look at like Revelation 13 and uh, where all they that do not receive the mark and the mark of the beast in their right hand or their forehead you know, are, are, are going to essentially forfeit their life. This is where, this is how intolerant it's going to become. It's going to be their way or no way. And so, no, they're, they're not going to have any tolerance. I think at first they're going to come as real nice guys, though. I don't think they're going to do that right off the bat. But eventually it's going to get to the point where enough people have bought into it and enough strong delusion is there that, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're not going to be tolerant whatsoever. Barbara Marks Hubbard states, The end of this phase of evolution shall come. All will know their choice, all will be required to choose. All who choose to be natural Christs will be guided from within as to how to proceed. All who choose not to evolve will die off. 
the kindergarten class of Earth will be over, unquote. Robert Mueller, previously mentioned, states, quote, I am surprised that no one has yet thought of creating a pro-Earth, humanity-challenging organization which would put itself in the shoes of our Mother Earth and rejoice whenever humans diminish in numbers or consume less. It would give yearly prizes to people, events, or institutions which achieve a reduction of the human population or of the consumption of Earth resources. The first prize should go to the United Nations, which through its world population conferences and anti-population work has prevented 2 billion 200 million more people from being born between 1952 and the year 2000. The more you look into where the 2012 ideas originated, and, and honestly, most of the 2012 theories are relatively new, that is, people attaching significance to the fact that the Mayan calendar ends. And almost without exception, they are by people that are channeling entities. A lot of time they are, there. a lot of times they say it's the Pleiadians that they're talking to, or the Syrians, or in the case of David Wilcock, it's Ra and Seth. Uh, most of the time, what the entities are telling the people uh, don't always match up, but they always seem to be telling the same things. And for the most part, a lot of those early people that got the information from uh, spiritual entities uh, were saying that it was a great cosmic enlightenment that was coming in 2012. And so uh, that to me is, seems to be the most direct um, idea that the spirit world wants us to think because it's oftentimes accompanied with this idea that they want you, they want the person they're telling to go out and tell more people. So 2012 became significant on the internet because people felt like it was their mission to tell other people because they were having supernatural experiences most of the 2012 theories will fall into one or two categories either they're going to be you know that in 2012 there's going to be some great enlightenment they say it's a spiritual evolution or a consciousness shift or a vibrational change or something to that effect and the other uh, the other half of it seems to be more about a cataclysmic uh, events that are going to happen in 2012 usually you know they're based off the idea that the Mayan calendar uh, ends or, re or restarts in um, in 2012 2012 is being pushed on the public through books, documentaries, speakers, and even major motion pictures. We are meant to believe that December 21st, 2012, will either be a catastrophe for humanity or a time when there is a consciousness enlightenment and a world shift, a time when humanity evolves. However, when you consult the scholars who study the Mayan calendar, they don't seem to support these views at all. University of Florida anthropologist Susan Gillespie says the 2012 phenomena comes from the media and from other people making use of the Maya past to fulfill agendas that are really their own. Despite the publicity generated by the 2012 date, Susan Milbrath, curator at Latin American Art and Archaeology at the Florida Museum of Natural History, stated that, quote, We, the archaeological community, have no record or knowledge that the Maya would think the world would come to an end in 2012. I think probably the most significant reason that, that all of them are wrong is because what they say that is going to happen in 2012 isn't. That is, although the Mayan calendar might be ending, there is no galactic alignment, whether it be um, the Earth actually won't be aligning with the center of the galaxy um, in the sense and that actually won't happen for another 30 million years. So, and even if it was, um, there's no necessarily any evidence that anything would happen, but it's really a moot point because there isn't anything happening. Uh, secondly, uh, there is no actual alignment of the planets. It's another thing that people are saying is going to cause the enlightenment or the c catastrophes. Uh, and this goes on and on. It's the same thing with the solar flares. It's the same thing with uh, Planet X or Nibiru or all those things aren't happening. And it's, it's, it's uh, very interesting uh, how you actually can go point by point and find out that each one of those supposed catalysts aren't true. Sandra Noble, executive director of the Foundation for the Advancement of Mesoamerican Studies in Crystal River, Florida, states, To render December 21, 2012 as a doomsday event or a moment of cosmic shifting, she says, is a complete fabrication and a chance for a lot of people to cash in, unquote. Many people are indeed cashing in because of the 2012 hysteria. But the reason 2012 is being pushed on the public so much is because it is in 2012 when the elite occultists and the New Age advocates 
plan to usher in the age of Aquarius, one world system. Siri Data points out that the New Age consensus is that the age of Aquarius, one world system will be ushered in in 2012. Quote, it is generally agreed that the actual time that we enter the age of Aquarius will be 2012. Unquote. Could this whole 2012 concept be propaganda to get people to accept the age of Aquarius in 2012? Eugene Gallagher likewise notes that the supposed age of Aquarius is expected to arrive in 2012. Quote, the term New Age is most closely correlated with the astrological idea that we are about to enter a new age, the age of Aquarius, which will arrive around 2012. Unquote. Michael P. Mao states, Yet 2012 does not mark the end of the world as oft predicted, but the birth of a new golden era, popularly known on the Earth plane as the Age of Aquarius. Unquote. Dr. C. L. Pepler explains the New Age view that 2012 is the start of the Age of Aquarius. Quote, they believe the next age will start around A.D. 2012 and will be the Age of Aquarius. This, they say, will be an age of enlightenment and world unity a post-Christian world in the fullest sense of the word." Unquote. 2012 is a clever deception to get you to accept the Age of Aquarius New World Order under the mask of a Mayan prophecy. In fact, the elite New World Order at the top of the pyramid want the public to believe in 2012, thus proving that they are behind this propaganda. The Club of Rome, by its own admission, is a globalist think tank. The aim of this organization, founded by Urban Laszlo, is to solve the world's problems and erect a solution, a new world order, one world government, the same theme we have been talking about in the film. On January 31, 2009, the Club of Rome held the Future of the American Hemisphere Conference. Francesco Stippo kicked the conference off with a speech. Francesco Stippo is a member of the U.S. Club of Rome. He authored the book World Federalist Manifesto, Guide to Political Globalization, where he states, quote, Political globalization is the creation of a world government which regulates the relationships among governments. Well, founder of the Club of Rome, Irvin Laszlo, along with popular New Age author and student of Jiddu Krishnamurti, Deepak Chopra, along with globalist Mikhail Gorbachev, have all authored a book together entitled World Shift 2012. This book advocates the 2012 theories extensively so it appears that the elite have vested interest in this 2012 hysteria and they want the public to accept it. Irvin Laszlo's Club of Rome founded another spin-off organization called the Club of Budapest. Now it is this elite organization, the Club of Budapest, which is promoting 2012 and the New Age Ascension beliefs to the public. New Age members of the Club of Budapest include Robert Mueller, former General Secretary of the UN, and Barbara Marks Hubbard who stated quote we have been projecting the transformation in 2012 it is happening now unquote founder of the club of Budapest Irvin Laszlo is also featured on the pro 2012 ascension website worldshift2012.org this website heavily promotes the idea that the world is about to end in 2012 if there isn't a transformation based on consciousness resulting in a new global order under the Partners section of the website, the State of the World Forum, which Zeitgeist is connected to, is listed on the site. This ties the New World Order to 2012, in that the 2012 hysteria is being pushed by the New World Order to the public to rally humanity together for a one world government. Under the Endorsement section of the WorldShift2012.org site, Mikhail Gorbachev is also listed. Mikhail Gorbachev, the communist New World Order advocate. Thus, it is quite clear that the global elite want people to believe in 2012 so that they can achieve their age of Aquarius one world system, which they now claim will emerge in 2012. It's a very clever deception that a lot of people have fallen for. Will anything happen in 2012? Maybe. Will it have to do with any prophecy of Maya? No. If anything does happen, it will be the New World Order who engineers it and ushers in their global system. The reason the Christian anti-New World Order researchers have been silenced and replaced with New Age advocates 
is because the New World Order occultists and New Age advocates hate biblical Christianity. Why? Because the Bible not only refutes their New Age beliefs, but it predicted their coming utopia, calls it out as an evil world system, and tells people to resist it. First, in the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy, he warns of these supposed ascended masters who will deceive people with false doctrines. Quote, the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Paul also predicts the New Age movement, quote, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. New Agers will often claim that the Bible promotes their astrological beliefs. However, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, astrology is forbidden and identified as an abomination to God. Quote, Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. Zeitgeist's main source, Acharya S., claims that Jesus talks about the age of Pisces in Matthew 28:20, 20, which states, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. However, although the zodiac was around in first century Palestine, the age concept was not around yet. So the biblical writers could not have been referencing the astrological age. Dr. Noel Swerdlow, professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago states, within which group of stars the vernal equinox was located was of no astrological significance at all. The modern ideas about the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius are based upon the location of the vernal equinox in the regions of the stars of those constellations. So when this woman says that the Christian fish was a symbol of the coming age of Pisces, she is saying something that no one would have thought of in antiquity." Unquote. When Matthew 28.20 20 talks about the end of the age, or in Greek, the end of the eon, he is not talking about astrological ages, as this concept was not around yet. The age referred to is that of Jewish understanding. As J.P. Holding remarks, quote, Zeitgeist is correct that when Jesus refers to the end of the eon, he doesn't mean the end of the world. However, he is also not speaking of the astrological age of Pisces. Rather, in the first century Jewish thought, there was an awareness of the current age, Ha-Alom ha ze and the age to come, Ha-Alom Ha-Ba. The distinction between the two appears both in the New Testament and in other Jewish writings. This has nothing to do with astrology." Unquote. Zeitgeist merely tried to deceive the public into the New Age worldview by distorting the biblical data which actually condemns astrology. Moreover, Jesus, Paul, and John predict this coming world teacher, Antichrist or Maitreya, and the New World Order, One World Government. And it is this reason that the elite and the New Agers hate true biblical Christianity. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians, quote, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it is from us, to the effect that the day of our Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. Jesus Christ warned of the Antichrist and false Christs. He says not to believe anyone who says, Look, the Christ has returned. For Jesus Christ's real glorious second coming comes after the false Christ or Antichrist deceives the world. Matthew 43 states, And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and will kill you. 
and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise, and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, so if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great in the book of Revelation, the Apostle John warns about this evil world teacher who humanity worships as he claims to be God. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on the right hand or their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man and his number is 666. John then talks about how the leaders of the world will form a one world system and give authority to the Antichrist or false world teacher. Quote, the ten horns which you saw were ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So if this Maitreya is real, and if he has the support of the New World Order, and if he plays a role in the coming world system, there is a high potential that he is in fact the Antichrist. We will have to wait and see. The Bible talks about how the real Lord Jesus Christ will return after this world system is created, and this world teacher deceives the planet. Revelation 6 says, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? The time that it's talking about in, in the Bible is, is actually going to be a time when the world is going to be extremely happy to be in this new system. And that includes people that right now think that they know all about the new world order and all this stuff. Um, these, those people included with the rest of the world are going to be happy with being in the new system. Um, the new, what the Bible describes is something that is almost impossible to believe in the sense that um, people are going to give their worship. These are politically correct people are going to give their worship to a man. That they're going to that something is going to happen to cause them to worship a man. Um, and that that is something we're not ready for. It's it's something that uh, that that political leaders don't right now do miracles, you know, for the most part. Right. That the whole concept requires new input. Something different has to happen and I think that when you look at what the new age is saying what they say is going to happen what every movie is talking about right now this idea that in there is a new rebirth coming a new age is going to be supernatural that's, that the aliens are going to come back and all these concepts that if it really happened we would be many many things would happen none the least not the least of which would be that we would uh, as a as a world start to be believing in some new sort of doctrine uh, namely that that God doesn't exist but that we are gods ourselves and the way that that would function is that um, well here are aliens and they were just like us at one time and we're going to evolve like them and be more like them that inherent in that is the idea that we are all, also gods the message that the New Age elite don't want you to know is that there is one God and 2,000 years ago he entered into creation as Jesus Christ lived a perfect sinless life 
and willingly died on the cross to pay for our sin. And if we accept Jesus Christ into our heart as Lord and repent of our sin, then we are spiritually saved forever. It is this message that the New Agers hate and want to stamp out. But if you realize that the New Age and the New World Order doctrine is a lie and an abomination, and if you want true salvation and the power to stand with Christ against this coming system, say this prayer with me and become a true child of God. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to come into my heart as Lord. I accept what you did for me on the cross, dying for my sin. I repent of my sin and I wish to live a life for you. Following your teachings found in the New Testament. Please forgive me of my wicked ways and transform me into a child of God. I pray in Jesus' mighty name, Amen. Come Lord Jesus. You know, though he understands sometimes what a terrible burden it is to know some of the things that I know and try to wake people up and impart this knowledge to them and find out that they just have walls built in front of them. They want to be slaves. But we're making some chinks in those walls. You must publish only documented fact. And you must stay away from printing articles from people who will not document as fact what they put in their articles. That's why my broadcast scares the hell out of socialists. That's why in a White House memorandum I was named as the most dangerous radio host in America. Not because I'm going to go out and shoot somebody, but because I shoot documented facts which cannot be refuted. That's why. That's what's dangerous. Seek ye the truth, and the truth will make you free, and nothing else will do it. Jesus Christ has never lied to anybody. Why won't you listen to him? Don't spread a rumor. Spread the truth. Document it. Prove it. Make it irrefutable, and you too will become dangerous to those who admire us in lies and enslave us in socialism. Traditions of pagan theosophy bound to be thousands of offshoots of Crowley, students of Alice C. Bailey who follow the lies of Helena Blavatsky, radically altering, changing the pages of history, laying the groundwork forced by the tools of Lucifer, paving the way for the United Nations, a slow preparation, patiently waiting since the creation, the garden of Eden, a planet whose placement in time is persuaded by aliens, outside invasions, abductions, and cow mutilations, creating in an atmosphere right for the picking with movies and Hollywood implanting trickery, mastery over the masses, a whole world collapses and panic all desperate for someone to save them, obey anyone that will answer the questions, the savior of sorts, a new age messiah, the wolf in sheep's clothing is what will transpire, the